operating a manufacturing company is not complicated. Knowing what you need to know in order to operate that company is very complicated. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I'm speaking with Roger Krulak, who is the CEO of Full Stack Modular. For 12 years, Roger served as SVP of Mixed Use and Residential Development at the Forest City Ratna Companies. And during that time, he was responsible for entitling and planning over 1,000 residential apartment units integrated into many of FCRC's uh, retail projects. So Roger spearheaded the first R&D project for modular construction at Forest City Ratna Companies, FCRC, in 2008. And this initiative led to the creation of the FC modular division, which focused on incorporating technology into construction workflows and using modular building systems. In 2016, Roger formed Full Stack Modular um, after assembling an investment group to purchase FC Modular's IP and their facilities. And since its founding, Full Stack Modular has established itself as a first mover in using advanced technologies for building design and high rise modular construction. Their current pipeline includes hundreds of thousands of buildable square feet for hospitality, multifamily, and student housing. Roger received the Popular Mechanics Breakthrough Award in 2014 for his work on creating high-rise modular process. He also sat on the international panel of experts for Singapore from 2014 to 2016. He is a frequent speaker at the universities um, around the school that are top in design, such as MIT, Harvard, and Yale. And he's been publicly recognized as a leader in innovation with multiple features in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Wired, and many others. So a very impressive CV and a real delight and treasure uh, privilege to be able to sit down and speak with Roger. Um, and in this episode, we look at a number of different issues and items, including the future of modular construction and design manufacture. We also look at how Roger works successfully with architects and what are the key components to a successful relationship um, and the kind of mindset and attitude and skill base that architects really can benefit from or can utilize or can bring to, if you like, a successful design manufacture process. And we also discuss about how modular construction and design manufacture will play a vital role in the future of sustainability. So loads of gold in this episode. Sit back, relax and enjoy Roger Krulak. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Roger, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I am doing very well, thank you. How are you, Ryan? I'm very well, thank you. So you are a 25-year veteran in New York of you know development work. You are the president and founder of Full Stack Modular. You've been really pioneering in the kind of design for manufacture or pre um, fabricated modular homes um, and, if, and you've worked with a number of different architects on different types of skills um, and projects uh, so very excited to be talking to you about your experience and your work and I know that you come from a great lineage of contractors and builders so I guess the first the first question is how would you describe full stack <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And yes, uh, Ryan, I would I would uh, call uh, Full Stack Modular a design manufacture construct uh, solution, and we are specifically focused on mid to high rise solutions in the dense urban environment. And that, in my world, is multifamily housing, uh, student housing, hotels, and attainable workforce housing, mostly. Fantastic. And how come you decided to start to focus on, on this niche, on this particular area of construction? What, what's wrong with the construction industry as it is? 
<laughs> How long's the podcast? <laughs> I mean, uh, with, with all uh, with all of kidding aside, I'm, uh, our process, uh, you know, construction industry is somewhere around 13 and a half percent of the world economy mm -hmm. and uh, the housing needs uh, in the world grow um, incrementally every year at a pace that we cannot even come close to keeping up with uh, from a production perspective. Mm -hmm. And. Um, we are one of the few industries that invests almost nothing uh, in technology, although that's changing. And uh, um, the process doesn't, uh, until now, hasn't included any um, economies of scale, manufacturing technology, increased productivity. I, I guess the last thing is, is that construction industry is about the only industry that loses productivity on a yearly basis rather than gains as an industry. So those are some of the reasons I have about 50 others, but that, those are the, those are the major ones. Well, well it's, it's interesting. I was talking to somebody the other day and they were saying that construction is the, the, the second least digitized and updated industry after agriculture being the, the, the kind of the first one. And, and I, and I find this really, really fascinating. And it's like one of the, the last industries to really be fully kind of optimized from, from your perspective, why, why is this such a challenge? I, I, I think, uh, I think pretty much any industry in the world, uh, that you're trying to shift that is large and it's sort of like turning a big ship versus a small ship, right? It, right. It's 13 and a half percent of the world economy. Um, the stakeholders associated are, you know, developers, architects, engineers, general contractors, uh, local and federal governments, um, uh, on and on and on. And to try to get everyone to rethink the way that they've been doing something is challenging to say the least. And mm -hmm. the stakeholders, um, people don't like change. I mean, very rare do I meet someone who says like, I can't wait till my life changes again. Uh, and so the, the industry is, um, you know, pretty much a stick in the mud for a long time. And uh, the reality is, is that we basically build like we built in the Middle Ages. Uh, if you want to make yourself laugh, look up uh, standing up walls for castles in the Middle Ages and then look up the way that they prop up pre uh, precast walls uh, in, in most uh, in most locations. I mean, it's exactly the same way that it was done in 1464 or something yeah so, uh, it's pretty astonishing. so so we're not quick to change and uh and the stakeholders um and i'm not i mean not including all of the stakeholders that sell product or um software or um uh or or any of the other associated products and of course anything that shifts is going to require them to shift the way they think so it's, mm -hmm. it's a pretty colossal task i think that's most of it is is it, it so, so? There's a lot of different stakeholders who actually need to kind of be on board with this movement. And I, you know, my, I, I said to you last time when we spoke, when I was working at RSHP in London, um, that a lot of the work that I was doing there was on design for manufacture housing, and there was Oxley Woods that got built, and you know, and and the developers were always there was always this kind of tension between the architect and the and the kind of the contracting team who were who were who were designing and building the, the work and the developers were always very, very tentative and nervous and, you know, scared. How, how have you managed to kind of put people at ease? How do you sell them on the advantages of the, of this, of this modular mode of construction? Well, I mean, I, I think, uh, uh, to, to coin a British phrase, the proof is in the pudding, right? So the reality is, is that we built the tallest modular building in the world. And it is now not the tallest modular building in the world, but it is still the tallest modular building in the United States. And when you can come look, touch, and feel a, a, a product in my, which is what I like to call it, that is high quality, attractive, uh, and entirely built out of muds, that's a you know that's a good that's a good proof point. But in addition to that, you have a bunch of factors that are driving people to reconsider: <clears throat> increased costs now increased um, borrowing costs. You've got uh, trade. Uh, people are not going into the trades for the most part anymore. So low skilled workforce, um, a, a diminishing workforce, 
and again, ending needs. So at some point, you got to find something to try to fill that huge uh, void and the void just gets bigger. So I think um, I think sometimes it takes a little longer, but sooner or later, everybody wakes up and now you, you've got this problem and you don't have any solutions. It's probably mm -hmm. a good idea to explore if maybe we can find some way to fill that massive gap with something. And uh, I think that's I don't I, I don't want to, you know, sort of I don't want to take too much credit other than that. I've been uh, banging on people's doors for the last 15 years, unlike uh, some of the sort of upstarts, um, you know, it's a necessity. Right? It, yeah. it, you need a solution it's, it's, uh, or, or, or we're just going to everybody's going to be out, you know, homeless. I mean, it's just, you know, it's not everybody, but a lot of people. And that's well, well, I guess I guess one of the other sort of um, failings of traditional procurement is the bidding process and the kind of you know the amount of energy that's put in into the documentation, both on the architect's side and then the work that the contractors have to do, and you know how bids end up just getting either squeezed and then they're not they're not realistic bids in the first place. This it, it just seems so much wasted energy in that in that process and can you just walk us through a little bit of the, the the how bidding process works with the kind of modular approach and the efficiencies that it creates sure of course i mean look i, I think um modular is one of uh, you know our solution of volumetric modular is one solution of trying to integrate some industrialized work process into uh creating the built environment and the design bid build process um if you've ever went to school and talked to a professor about anything uh yeah. they would tell you that it's an absurd idea right it's like what what is like you would like to build high quality you know housing at a rapid pace so what i'm going to do is i'm going to have some artist who has some training go come up with an idea with no input from the people that are going to create the products that go into it then i'm not going to tell them how much i want it to cost and they are going to come up with their wildest dreams then we're going to take their wildest dreams and put it out to a bunch of people who have no stake in keeping the costs any lower or under control because they don't know what the budget is they're going to give their best estimate which they're giving for free so of course they're going to give you a high estimate so why because they have no stake in the game and then when it comes out too high i'm going to send it back to the architect who was told just to imagine their dreams <clears throat> and then i'm going to go back to the contractor who again i paid no money and do that over and over again five to seven times until the contractor doesn't want to work for free anymore and says Yep, whatever cost you want it to be, that's what it is. And the and the architect says, oh, I could give up these five things because I've already invested too much and I haven't made any money. Now the developer's happy. Lo and behold, you know, four years down the road from something that could have been done in two months, uh, mm -hmm. and the project starts. Costs go up because, of course, it wasn't accurately <laughs> bid. I mean, that's what happens in today's world. And the lowest bidder wins, of course, the lowest bidder be honest, I've been the lowest bidder on projects, you usually miss something, right? So so that's mm -hmm. a bad, that's a bad paradigm too. like, most qualified, uh, you know, as I, um, I know that at one point, uh, certain government contracts for in the UK and other parts of Europe, they take this the middle, right, the, the you know, eliminate the top and bottom and then take the middle. Um, so the whole thing, <laughs> the premise is ridiculous. It's still, I mean, it's, still the, it's still the same thing, like where you take the lowest or the middle or, 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 or whatever. It's still the it, same game, right? Like, what are yeah. you doing? Instead, like most things we do in life that are effective, I mean, you read leadership books all the time, right? You sit mm -hmm. with the team that has our stakeholders and the, the, you know, as well as your end customer and you say, okay, we want to develop a product, something that is going to work for me as an architect aesthetic for the developer to provide the returns that are necessary, utilizing a system that creates efficiency. And we're all going to sit at the table and say, here's our budget. How do we do this? Yeah. Um, it makes sense. And so it makes sense. I, I, and and the fact is, and I, I know can't uh, sort of leave without saying this conversation without saying that almost everything that's created in the world right now, especially for consumption or use in some way, is manufactured from mm -hmm. the paperclip to the spaceship, from the hyperloop to the coffee cup. It's all manufactured. 
And a lot of that stuff is super simple, but a lot of it is far more complex than a building. And, uh, and, and it works. So what's the problem? It's, this isn't, uh, uh, this isn't rocket science, right? Which is <laughs> very sophisticated. And I have friends who are rocket scientists and they laugh about this. They're like, it's not hard. We can do this. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's really, really f a fascinating comparison when we start looking at the innovations that's happening in aerospace and, and you know, and, and technology and, and how these incredibly complex things are being manufactured and put together. And we see something like what SpaceX is doing on a more kind of commercial scale. Yeah. And then and then you're quite right. It's like, well, hold on. These the buildings are not as complicated as this. Why yeah. is there such, you know, why is there such enormous inefficiencies? So with the design um manufacture construct model, how does it how does it work? How are we kind of starting to streamline uh, a process? So basically the only we, way we work now, which was not always the case, is is that a, cu a customer comes to us and or an architect and or a team, customer architect, and comes to us and says, we love what full stack modular is doing. We think that industrialized construction has value and we are looking to build things that are within what you claim is your sort of, you know, both vertical and business model. And we'd like to explore that with you. Um, can we start a sort of design build charrette that is going to design the product, you know, deliver some expected costs, goals mm -hmm. and timing. Uh, and, and, and the, you know, I, I really like working with this architect and I, you know, the associated look fit, finish, feel and experience that the users will ultimately have. Let's make this happen. And, and that is usually, uh, it's, first of all, it's a happy day for me when somebody comes to me and says that <clears throat> because it's happening more and more. Um, yeah. but it's also the best chance for success. Um, yeah. because if you built a bad, if you designed a bad building that costs too much money, modularing, modularizing it, I can't even say the word, uh, modularizing it doesn't fix the problem. If it's a bad design or a cost ineffective design, I shouldn't say even bad design because it may be a very good design, but a cost ineffective design and cost is a concern of yours, then that's probably not going to fix the problem. How, how, how do you integrate the design process with the modular systems? Because this has often been one of the criticisms that architects will have of, of modular um, construction is that we don't want to be like pinned back and dictated to by the system. And then, you know, I love that. Um, so it's uh, some of my favorite conversations. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, the reality is, is that we are uh, in a world of built environment and need. And our focus is mostly in housing or, or, or either temporary or permanent. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so let me answer the question in a couple of ways. The first way is, um, if you're building multifamily housing in a dense urban environment, the parameters that exist, regardless of the method with which you're building it, are significant. You have yeah. to have so much light and air. You have to have emergency exits. You have to have elevators. You have to have, you know, bathrooms some way, somehow. You, you know, you have to have access. You have to have... Um, livability, you have to have the ability to cook and all of those things. So starting out before full, before modular or full stack ever gets considered, the parameters are pretty, are, are, are pretty set. So if you don't want to be pigeonholed, you should probably not build multifamily buildings or design them as an architect. I'm just saying if that, if that's what you want to do, there is a world of other things out there that allow the freedom of, uh, of um, agency to sort of express yourself in any way that uh, the museum donor will, uh, will accept or, yeah. uh, you know, um, or, the, or, the, or the person building the stadium will, will allow, um, et cetera. So if you're, if you're an architect and you have um, conceded to share agency with codes, uh, mm -hmm. and um, that then the only thing that modular is doing uh, is to say, look, there are some parameters which make uh, building this in a factory more effective uh, than than not. 
Um, there's not much we can't build, but there's a lot of stuff we, we probably ought not build because it's just not efficient. Uh, and so, so, so what I, like anything else that's designed, industrial designers, uh, you know, uh, inventors, et cetera, you have to share some agency with the product with which you're utilizing in order to create those items. So if you're building a computer, you need a computer chip and you're going to have to share, um, just as an example, or if you're building a car, you need an engine and the engine has to somehow fit in a place that it can propel the, the car. So if you think about it that way, is that we're not necessarily asking you to limit um, your creativity. We're asking you to utilize uh, and share agency with a set of products that can be yeah. used efficiently to um, to create that which you know you as an architect are designing uh, to the to the goals of the developer. Yeah. And if the goals of the developer are I just don't want to spend any money doing this, then the amount of variability that we that we that we can utilize as a team is going to be limited as compared to I just need to build this twice as fast and I need you know this to be a five star resort in the middle mm -hmm. of you know, in the middle of Dubai, it's, it's a different, it's a different conversation. And we have the ability to do both of those things pretty effectively. Yeah. It's just, everybody needs to understand, uh, what well, I, 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 I guess what becomes very interesting. And certainly we saw this in, in my past experience working on this, this kind of uh, technology is that the relationship with the contractor and architect starts very early on, which is great. Immediately. Uh, and, and 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 there is this kind of constant dialogue and feedback, and it's not necessarily like the system dictating anything. It's two people working together and finding out a new solution. And, you know, there's a, there's a push and pull. And this I this I really really like because you know the traditional architectural process is there can be a long period without any input from a contractor, and you know in the worst case architects are producing drawings which are kind of in an abstract reality, not not thinking or considering, you know, how are you going to put your hand in there behind something to tighten up a bolt and all these usual complaints that, you know, that architects and <laughs> builders will, will, will have. So th this, this, the modular format is very interesting because there's something nice, there's something immediate about designing something and then it's, it's as close as you can get to design print. There you go. There's the building. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, uh, I absolutely think so. And look, I'll give you an example of some conversation I just had yesterday with an architect who's looking at a hotel in Vermont. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and they asked me, they said, you know, I want to understand your system, you know, very, one of my favorite kinds of, you know, calls. And they're like, well, you know, what, what do you, what can you do with the facade and what types can you put on? And, uh, you know, can you, to, uh, you know, uh, sort of setbacks and fenestration and can you add patios? And, and, I, and my answer, of course, is, yeah, we can do all of those things, but I'd like you to sort of keep in mind what the developer's goals are because, um, for instance, hanging, a, I'll just give you an example, hanging a balcony on the outside face of a building in different locations with maybe even various finishes is far less complicated than creating a balcony out of a facade system where you have now an additional uh, sidewall floor and ceiling that you have to you have to integrate. So mm -hmm. of course we can do them both, but I just want you to understand the costs and the and the complications associated with it as you're starting to think about this. So what so what does your team look like then? I'm I'm imagining that you've guy you guys have got a pretty uh, extensive set of in-house designers yourself and technicians and what what does what does your company look like on the inside? Well, we we uh so we have uh so we have a we have a we have a production team. I'll start sort of like where what matters like how do you actually make this? Uh, because that drives a lot of uh, a lot of the process and the conversation that we have. Mm -hmm. We have a full um we have a full uh, integration and collaboration with a um, with a design for manufacturer BIM modeling team, which are you know architects and engineers um, that uh, that that uh, um, take the uh, drawing the, basically the permit drawings created by the architect with our design assist and turn it into a producible product. Um, we then have uh, we have um, 
a, a pre-con team who's got lots of experience in modular construction and other kinds of construction so that they can review the process uh, and the items and the selections and the hopefully um, hopefully a project uh, project specifications and manual that actually match the project that you're building. We can get into that conversation if you want. And then and then uh, you sort of talk about anything that sort of uh, commitments we've made to using a system uh, and a product that matches the the production process that is created by full stack. Um, and then we have a sort of a design and technology group that sort of uh, at, which is on the on the business development design side that interfaces with that you know sort of the local chosen architect um, <laughs> to try to work as a team with the developer to create that I worked uh, the other, as you can see I worked the other way because really what we do is um, completely inside out rather than outside in um, and so I followed that uh, that train because that's the way we think about things um, how do we make what it is that you have vision in a way mm -hmm. that works and is effective and uh, until we do that uh, that uh, chain of process we can't really report on that and and so it, so it's less like a kind of ready-made product that's ready to go and much more you're actually designing the product and then it's designed to be manufactured off-site in factories and it's either going to be panelized or volumetric or whatever is the most appropriate solution yeah and, well and we are a volumetric solution so that's what we right, do okay. um and uh and the answer to your question is we have um a set of products uh, mm -hmm. and we have a set of systems and processes that allow us to be efficient and it is flexible, uh, but not endless. Um, and so, and so, um, so it is not, um, uh, you know, you go to a catalog and, uh, and, and choose, you know, these four types of mods. I mean, we have those, but I mean, you choose these types of mods and you have to build a building that way because, um, Despite uh, my talk about de design for manufacture and sharing agency, et cetera, I am a fan of architecture. And I do believe that there is a value in creating a building that has a quality experience for the people who are who are experiencing it in a living basis and uh, being compatible with the neighborhood and the, and the area that it lives in. Uh, so 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 we don't. Um, you know, and 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 because of that, uh, as an example, you know, a, a a one bedroom apartment in New York could be 460 square feet or you know, like 45 square meters, but you know, in in uh, Chicago, it's double that, right? So yeah. so so we do have the flexibility to adapt uh, the the products to uh, to the location, the aesthetic, et cetera. Um, so, but we do have, um, as part of that, a game plan for the full SMEP integration into that system in a way that we know works effectively. So it's more of a process than it is a product at this point anyway. Got it. So, so what does a, what does a full stack construction site look like? It's, how does it, how does it, how does it differ from a regular? Basically, uh, if you think about what we do, um, you give us something to sit on and that could be a steel, uh, a podium, parking lot, uh, concrete slab, doesn't really matter, just a table. Uh, give us a table to sit on and then our mods uh, stack up on top of those facade installed, um, uh, hallways installed, elevator shafts, stairwells, all the finishes in the units, all the appliances if you'd like, even the furniture if you'd like. Uh, stack it all the way up to the parapet, and then you put on a roof, uh, drop in an elevator, and then uh, if you can imagine that the building is, uh, it's all bolted together. There's no welding on site or anything of the sort. Yeah. If you bolt it all together and you connect all the mechanical systems vertically and horizontally, mm -hmm. um, th then you need somewhere where you can have access to those spaces, and we try to limit that to the hallways. Um, and then, uh, so then the hallways remain unfinished they're there but they're unfinished and that way you can connect everything vertically and horizontally and then uh, and then finish the architectural finishes in the hallway and the building is done and ready to go so imagine um you know a, a um you know 
12,000 square meter building mm-hmm. keep, uh, converting back and forth. Uh, so, so uh, you know, uh, feet, feet, feet's okay. Feet. Yeah. Yeah. 120,000 square feet, uh, you know, 12,000 square meters, whatever, 11,000. And, um, you know, you, you would probably have aggregate trades once the foundation is in, uh, you know, 25, 30 people, uh, if you're a lot would be a lot. Um, mm-hmm. and, and they, they, are going up elevators or lifts you you know we have ways of using the elevator shafts for lifts uh, if you don't want to do that there's no scaffolding required on the building because it's completely enclosed um and the facade is already on so if you're a neighbor uh, of any new building you want it to be a module or certainly a volumetric module solution that puts the facade on it's not going to be noisy uh, mm-hmm. not going to be a lot of people hanging around and it's going to be done quite quickly. Wow. So, 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 you know, you're saying at, at one level of the spectrum, you can actually have volumetric pieces up, up, you know, installed that have got the furniture, windows, appliances, all the finishes. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, no, it's super cool. Uh, you know, look, it's, uh, we, we, um, I kid, but I'm not actually kidding, but I'm a little bit, uh, you know, future uh, visioning. I would yeah. like to be able to have fully occupied buildings before they're actually installed on site. So if you could actually move people in uh, before they actually get there, and you know, with the help of a Tesla battery and some by the way for plumbing, it's actually relatively conceivable because yeah. when you go yeah. into these units, you can go to sleep. Uh, for some hotels, we put the sheets and the shampoo and stuff in. We don't actually put it in place, but we put it in a box so that they don't have to do all of that fit out um, yeah. when, they get, when they get to the site. So, you know, the TV is there and the refrigerator is there and the, the cooking appliances and the finishes and even the art on the wall. So, yeah, you could mm-hmm. you could move people in before the building was finished and then it would be fully occupied the day the elevator got a permit and you just put it and everybody can go home. So. Amazing. And and how so so at the moment is the majority of your work just in the just in New York, just in Brooklyn or have you... so so um so we uh we have two factories, one in Brooklyn, New York, one in Portland, Oregon. Um and we are doing work on both coasts right now and we are talking um to a number of companies about some export uh, both to the Caribbean and uh and to the Middle East and and elsewhere. Um you know that that uh that the cost uh, effectiveness um, of you know a building where we build at the at the rates we do at the efficiency we do is is, is cost effective. So, you know we're we're um, we're rapidly becoming global. And in terms of the factories, then does it always mean that the that you, is it the kind of process where you can set up? Say you had a project somewhere else which you hadn't worked before, that you would need to set up a new factory in order to kind of do the production, or do you always have the the same kind of production houses? How do you how do you scale it if you've got like yeah. fifteen different buildings happening and it, only it, two I factories? Mean, in my, yeah, in my look. Um, so the other thing about manufacturing that's different than the building process is yep. that all manufacturing is a maker by analysis uh, mm-hmm. and how do you get it all together? So most car factories, for example, they don't make anything, right? All they do is put it all together. Like they get the seats from somebody and the engine from somebody and the, and the, and the, the chassis from somebody and they just put it all together. So um, there's lots of ways to scale, right? One of the ways to scale is, um, is exactly what I said, which is just put it all together and build nothing in your factory. You just put it all together in your factory. And that's the one way to do it. And then the other way to do that is cooperate and create sort of um, even a more complex set of what we call sub-assemblies to be assembled more quickly. And then the, the other way, of course, is to, is to prop up another factory. But we don't... Um, the business of operating a factory um, is uh, is needs to be busy all the time. So propping up a factory and uh, and and training everyone how to build in a or assemble in a location and then having that move somewhere else isn't very effective. So, um, but again, sort of uh, looking to the future, uh, um, in, in my view, uh, and interesting, just heard the same thing at a venture uh, at a uh, convention I was just at, is that. My view is that the system by which we create buildings, the process by which we do it, ultimately could be taught 
manufacturing operating a manufacturing company is not complicated knowing mm -hmm. what you need to know in order to operate that company is very complicated so uh, to be able to take the knowledge base and the pro the processes associated with it and being able to franchise it if you will uh to do that has a huge you know that's how you grow it worldwide um mm -hmm. and we and we talk about that all the time we're not quite there yet i mean uh strong believers in sort of logistics and manufacturing feel like you need to have three operating factories in order to be able to reality test the effectiveness of the process because you can prop up one you can prop up two but you can't prop up three it's either either the yeah. systems yeah. fail or the systems work so we're we're headed in that direction but i you know i don't know where what you know what whether that's a year from now or three years from now or and, and, and prior to full stack, what what were you what were you doing? What was the what was the kind of career uh, path and trajectory you were on? And you know what what was the when would, did the leap happen, or when did the insight or the kind of the vision for full stack um, uh, occur? Uh, yeah, so that's a long story. So my great grandfather was a carpenter, and I, I grew up in the the development and construction business. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest, um, so construction is something that I've been around my whole life. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and development for that matter. Um, and uh, I was actually involved in, uh, in, the, in the sort of dot-com era, not this last one, but the one before that. And we were building data centers, you know, thinking about all of these things. Uh, and then it crashed. Uh, and so I went back to development and construction and moved to New York um, and was astounded at the cost and inefficiency. Um, and uh, and to be fair, my grandfather uh, um, Nate Chaffron was uh, was involved uh, with his company in a in a concrete modular manufacturing company in the seventies uh, to fill the needs of a governmental program called Project Breakthrough. So um, the idea of building the built environment in a volumetric modular solution is not either new under the sun nor new in Roger Krulak's life. So I've always been thinking about that. And then um, 2007, 2008, when everyone thought the world was ending, um, uh, 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 I was fortunate enough both to keep my job and to be able to get a little research and development money to figure out how to build modular buildings high rise, because at that time, the only tall modular building in the world of significant height was uh, in Wolverhampton, and it was a it was a student effort, uh, you know, as research. And then, of course, that company went out of business, and it never happened again. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, so that was um, uh, that was the first driver, and the second driver was that that uh, the company I worked for, uh, for City, they um, they had. Uh, bought 22 acres of land in Brooklyn and had committed to building 6,500 affordable housing units out of a total of, uh, you know, roughly 20,000. And the market in uh, New York from a construction basis is as volatile as the, as, as the, as the stock markets. So, right. you know, when that, it gets busy, everything goes up and when <laughs> it doesn't, everything goes down. And so it was very hard at a time when, you know, New York was growing significantly to think about being able to build effectively that way. And so I was lucky enough to be able to do an R&D effort to show how to build this. Uh, and that's, I know, a long answer, but that's sort of where I came from. And that's how Full Stack Modular was born. I then uh, bought it from Four City when they converted to a real estate investment trust. And, uh, and that's how Full Stack um, was, was I see, I see, I see, and 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 in terms of the kind of scaling for the future, what what would you like to see full stack kind of uh, accomplishing? Do do you think that this kind of um, construction methodology is appropriate for other building typologies, or is it really, you know, it really kind of comes into its own for multi residential? denser developments yeah i mean i i told you i think um the housing need is so big in the world that it's a pretty easy thing to concentrate on and dense urban yeah. environment despite uh the pandemic that we sort of have recovered from uh you know mm -hmm. people are sort of going back to the cities although may not be going to work every day um uh you know, in the office i should say they're probably going to work every day but not necessarily commuting to work every day um i think that that need globally uh is huge 
our process specifically, and we are a process, not the only process, sort of an industrialized, you know, construction. Um, it, it's well suited for things that are segmented, uh, you know, size appropriate for transport. So housing, as I described, other uses, you know, hospital rooms, very effective, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, medical facilities, certain parts of it, uh, of course, that, that are they're sort of segmented and organized that way. It's very effective. Um, and even, you know, the, the talk of every... Um, architecture magazine that, you know, sort of the, uh, the auxiliary dwelling unit, it works very well for that too, because at the end of the day, um, as long as the process is similar, you know, we don't really care from the factory's perspective where all the boxes are going, as long as they're all the boxes. Uh, and whenever you try to interrupt that process and flow, it's a little less efficient. Um, so yeah. offices generally don't make sense unless it's a, you know, like a, a dense, you know, small scale, you know, infill office, you know, that doesn't require too much large span that has to be all fit out in the, you know, in the field, that kind of stuff. Fantastic. Um, so let's have a little talk about for you, what makes a good relationship with an architect? Like what do architects need to know, understand, be open minded to let go of in order to be able to really maximize this type of um, construction system and, and really, you know, have it have it working for them, for the developer? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the idea, uh, the idea, look, if you're interested in doing a design build process with or without uh, industrialized construction or modular manufacturing, you're probably the right person, uh, you know, to be involved in this process. It's just mm -hmm. understanding that you're all going to sit at the table with common goals and find ways to solve that problem. Um, and the second that you, um, if you feel like, uh, if you're into gaming and you feel like you need to be the one holding the game board and have controls of the thing and, and you're not willing <laughs> to sort of, uh, you know, work as a team, then you should not try this. Because if you don't, it's a waste of time for everybody. And I have, you know, it's not as often as it used to be, but I have, you know, I have had meetings where, you know, we've gotten together with the developer and an architect that they introduced me to, and I just walked away going, I don't know what to do to help. Like, you should really just go decide if you want to do this or not, because this architect is not interested. And I do lecture, you know, uh, often at Harvard and I lectured at Yale and go to MIT pretty often and other great uh, institutions of, of design. And I love the classes and I love talking to the to the sort of the burgeoning architects of the future. Mm. And usually 80 percent to 90 percent of them are supercharged about the idea and then 20 percent don't like the idea of sharing their agency and i think that that's sort of a litmus test like if the idea of sharing your agency with a you know sort of a productization etc is not exciting to you don't try it like just yeah, don't. Yeah. And, and if it is then it's really fun right because so much of what architects have been forced to do because of the way that the process works today goes away like we can tell you what mechanical systems work in our systems and where they go we can tell you the kinds of flooring that are appropriate and what you might like to choose from we can tell you how we would like the bathroom to be laid out what would you like it to look like i mean we you know so uh, we can tell you the facade parameters and you can tell us what you you know the finishes that are exciting to you about that and you know all those things it's so much easier on so many levels um they don't have to you know, there's not a whole lot of pocheting to show you, you know, you're like, we'll figure out how much the shafts, like you don't have to lose space or change a design of a unit because you need a bigger shaft by the time we've gotten through, you know, schematic, engineered schematics, you know, like basically we're done by that. You know, like, you know, everything else is just fine tuning at that point. I, I, one of the other things that I think is very interesting is number one the the kind of potential for incredibly high performing spaces in terms of sustainability, energy, um, and also that there's there's a certain level of control that happens with inside of a factory environment that doesn't happen out on site. And 
you know, even if you're an architect, you've specified something and you want something to be done on site, you don't know if that actually happens. And nope. you know, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, so we build off of what you would call as-builts in the sort of traditional construction method because we build out of it. So everything we do is going to be precisely where it is in the plan because otherwise it won't fit together. So yeah. that's the first thing. Yes, we build to, you know, um, less than an eighth of, eighth of an inch tolerance across all systems, not just, you know, concrete, you know, not just steel, not just mechanical or plumbing. It's mm -hmm. so everything is exactly where it should be. So now think about the way the building lives in the future and you decide you want to retrofit a building, you pull up the plans and you like that, that drain is exactly there. And the structural beam that we had designed in that building is there. So if I want to open up this apartment to this apartment, no problem. The other thing that we can do because it's built in a factory, besides sort of integrating as much sustainability as the developer would like to, mm -hmm. is that monitoring is very simple for us because it's all done in a process that doesn't require um, me as a general contractor to source it to an electrical trade who uses their own engineer, who then uses their own purchasing team to purchase stuff that isn't meeting the requirements and needs. And I don't need to tell you what that submittal process looks like. And, and you don't have to do that. Um, and, uh, and it's pretty refreshing. Like we could actually, like architects could just design stuff that's beautiful, that works like it's, and, and free yourself from all, not, I mean, not all of it, because obviously there's still some bank requirements, et cetera, but the majority of it, you don't have to worry about. It. And uh, because we're manufacturers, we source everything. So if you tell me you don't want anything that doesn't have some certification on it, mm -hmm. it's not a problem for us. I mean, we, we buy everything. So it's pretty easy to make sure that we get we get that happening and we can come to you and say, hey, look, you know, these are the things that are available in there all within 350 miles of, you know, all within 350 miles of our factory. Does that work for you? It's a lot easier. I, I, I guess one, one of the other questions is, is, is that do our, do you think then our, you was talking about, you know, architects kind of being concerned about sharing their agencies, their agency, is there then this process where actually there isn't a need for an architect at all. And then, then there can be designers in house at full stack who are like architecturally trained and like, yeah, there. Look, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, if somebody comes to me and says, "Can you build a building without an architect?" Um, my answer is, "Of course, I can." Uh, yeah. You know, uh, do I think I mean, that that happens all the time as right. well? Right. No of course, it does, and oftentimes it's very disappointing. But but uh, but I don't. But what I, but I what I don't want people to think about, and I, you know, I'm not saying that that's not a possibility. But the mm -hmm. reality is that. There's a value to having a local architect who have has a sensibility about aesthetic and goals. I mean, I, um, you know, I think I'm pretty creative, you know, and I think I could, do, but I'm, I don't consider myself an architect in any way. And, and I do think the value is there. So my answer is, of course, I can build buildings without an architect, but I would much rather build a building that an architect feels is meeting the needs and design, you know, for experience and uh and and compatibility with its locale and do that in a way that is um accretive to the value of the end product and all of the players then i would say i can cut you out and save a few thousand bucks because i yeah. don't think at the end of the day that's valuable as a society I, so, so i don't uh so i i think architects losing their jobs I don't think so. I think architects losing jobs they didn't want to begin with, that's a possibility. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure how many of those I really want to build, to be fair. So, I, you know, so I, I think um, I, I say, I'll just use an example. I say this to the, the trades who do our on-site work. Um, you know, I say, because they, they're worried about losing work, et cetera. And I said, look, you're not going to lose work. You're going to be able to be very efficient and you're going to be able to predict quite precisely how much money you're going to make and how much time you're going to have to spend doing this. And how long has it been since an architecture firm can actually say, like, I really think this is going to take two months, two meetings a week. Like, like we, we collectively can get to that pretty quickly if we all cooperate in doing that. And, uh, and so the advantages is that it's also effective with your time. We you know what the architect can do um, 
uh, you know, efficiently in a way that is valuable. I said. So I think yeah. it's, it's, I, I think about it as I'm trying to squeeze efficiency out of something that is dismal from a, from a, from a, from a process perspective. And, and that's a value to everybody involved in it. So. Brilliant. So we're coming to the end of, uh, of, of our time here. We're also coming to the end of 2022. Yeah. Um, what, what is planned for 2023 for full stack? What would be, uh, some amazing results for you at the end? If we were to, if we were to talk again in a year's time, what would you have liked to have seen accomplished? Yeah. I mean, look, we are now engaged in, uh, design for manufacture processes with a bunch of serial developers who have realized that productization has value. They all have mm -hmm. really good architects and we are in the design process in four spaces, some of them out of the country. And, and, um, and what that will do is drive the need for, um, for two things, automation. And to me, uh, not in addition to automation, which is thinking about how all this stuff happens, again, more expeditiously and with higher quality, but also um, integrating um, th the sustainability to a level that, you know, we, we really can't do now with uh, with sort of unpredictable products. Because um, one thing that Fullstack is committed to is measuring, is measuring the performance of our buildings. Uh, and, uh, and, and the one thing that doesn't exist is there's not a lot of measuring of conventional buildings. Who measures yeah. that? I don't know who measures it. And I always get called by analysts. Uh, one other thing I got to complain about at the last uh, event I always had is, you know, like, they're like, how do you compare to a conventional building? I'm like, show me some statistics. I don't give me some answers, but I don't know. So, um, so the sustainability side, the impact side of, you know, high quality, good indoor air quality buildings that are located in areas where you don't have to, you know, add to the carbon footprint to get food and get transported. Like to me, being part of that ecosystem of trying to find a way to save our world, which is rapidly depleting uh, all mm -hmm. of its resources is super exciting. And, and to the extent that we can be a significant player in that, um, I think that's really where we'd like to be. Love it. Brilliant. Roger, thank you so much for your time uh, this afternoon, this morning. Where you, yeah. where you are. Um, absolutely fascinating to hear more in depth about um, full stack and the potential of design manufacture construction process. So really appreciate uh, the conversation. Thank you. And I fully appreciate being, uh, being brought on as a guest and having, uh, having the conversation because it always helps. So uh, thank you so much, Rianne. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.